I glanced to my right. John Frankenheimer, in a crisp, pale yellow linen shirt, sleeves rolled up, and fresh chinos, might have been one of his own leading men. He stood a good three inches taller than my six feet, his black hair only lightly touched with white at the temples, his heavy eyebrows as dark as Groucho's, only not funny. We'd met, but that's all. He motioned me over to a wrought iron patio set with an umbrella. I brought along a rum and coke. He carried a martini like an afterthought. At least he cleans up good, I said. He does, and takes direction. He took a sip. Or anyway, he does now. What do you mean he does now? His shrug was slow and expressive. A while back, his guy, Pierre Salinger, flew me from California to Gary, Indiana, where Bob was speaking, to shoot a campaign spot. And I'm not cheap. I believe you. Bob said he only had ten minutes to get me. And I said, then why fly me out from California? Well, the result was awful. The camera caught his hostility. Later, he called me at my hotel and asked if we could try again. I said we could if he gave me an hour and a half to show him how not to project cold arrogance. He took that on the chin, and I went over and did the spot fresh, and we've been friendly ever since. He'll need makeup for that cut. He studied his slumbering subject. I'll give it to him. Saved his son, I hear. He is one remarkable guy. Ever hear about how he taught himself to swim? Jumped off a boat in Nantucket Sound and took his chances. Chuckled to himself. Then when Bob and Ethel honeymooned in Hawaii, he saved some guy from drowning. He should have been a lifeguard. This country could use saving. I sipped. You're following the campaign with a camera crew, I understand. He nodded. Yes, for a documentary, but also to grab footage for more campaign spots. <laughs> He'll need both to beat Tricky Dick. But you've known Bob a long time, I take it? We go back to the rackets committee, and before. That seemed to confuse him. You worked for the government, back then? Not directly. I have a private investigation agency in Chicago. We have a branch here, the A-1. And that seemed to amuse him. Oh, I know who you are. Private eye to the stars. How many stories has Life magazine done about you, anyway? Too many, and not enough. His laugh was a single ha. Huh. <laughs> Too many, because it's like James Bond. Him being a spy is an oxymoron. Or just a moron, and not enough because publicity is good for business. Do I have to tell a film director that? He gestured with an open hand. Necessary evil. I leaned in. John, your film, The Manchurian Candidate. A stupid question, but do you think that could happen in real life? His smile came slowly, and then one corner of it twitched. Yeah, he said. I do. Bob was coming around. Star needs makeup, Frankenheimer said, getting to his feet. And better wardrobe. I needed to find a bathroom to put on my Botany 500 for tonight. I'd have to leave my 9mm Browning at the ambassador desk to be locked in their safe. When I emerged, I found Bob looking similarly spiffy in a blue pinstriped suit and white shirt. Frankenheimer was in the process of expertly daubing stage makeup on the candidate's scraped, bruised forehead. In the background, Ethel was giving orders to that college kid to deliver her children to the Beverly Hills Hotel, where they raided two bungalows to my measly one. We would be driven by Frankenheimer to the ambassador, and Ethel, not ready yet, would follow in another vehicle. The film director's car turned out to be a Rolls-Royce Silver Cloud. Even though I had made life a couple of times, this would be my first ride in one. Frankenheimer, who'd seemed so cool before, betrayed himself otherwise on the Santa Monica freeway with his bat-out-of-hell driving. When he accidentally raced right by the Vermont off-ramp and got snarled up in the Harbor Freeway Exchange, he swore at himself and pounded the wheel. Take it easy, John, Bob said from the back seat. Life is too short.